Yoram. Thank you so much. Well, it's really good to be here. Our folks marginally awake. You guys, you guys start things early here. I'm, I'm still catching up. Um, it's really good to be here. I'm here to talk about optimizing emergent structures, which um, seems a little bit of a strange topic. So I'm going to start off by trying to explain wh where I'm coming from and what, what, I'm, what I'm really focused on. I, I had this idea about C++. Uh, one of the things that I really like about it is that with C++, you write a very small piece of code in one place. Someone else, some other team, some other part of your company writes another very small piece of code. This happens a lot. Right? It happens over and over again, and as you write these small pieces of code, something starts to develop that's, that's quite remarkable. It, it, a very large system, a very complex system starts to develop, even though each person, right, each person's writing a small, reasonably isolated piece of code. And C++ makes this so easy and so powerful because it combines object-oriented programming, generic programming, templates, all of the things you need to really, really leverage this. However, it turns around and presents really unique challenges to optimizing that code. And a lot of people started writing C++ not because of generic programming or because of object-oriented programming, but because of C. Right? They started off with C, and they started off with C because C is really, really efficient. And as they use more and more of C++, sometimes they use it poorly, sometimes they have unfortunate implementations of C++, and they, they become disillusioned because they can't actually compensate for these emergent structures, these really complex structures that they end up building. So I see this as you know, us having kind of a classical problem, right? We have a problem of compiler complexity. Um, anyone here take a compiler course? Ooh, more hands than I thought. Anyone here take a compiler course with this textbook? All right. So, we have this idea of compiler complexity and how we're going to deal with it. Of course, I think the reason I like this textbook the most is because it's so preposterously wrong about how we deal with compiler com like language complexity today. But the other problem we have is that this isn't really a good figure to represent you know, the complexity that our compilers face today. We need something a little bit more like this. <laughs> because this is what compilers feel like when faced with C++. Okay? They feel like they're down here, right? And it's not pleasant. Okay? And so we've, we've got some real challenges. And I'm going to try and step through how compilers can tackle these challenges and do ch tackle these challenges. Now, at this point, I have to give a bit of a, a bit of a caveat. I'm not going to expect you guys to know anything about compilers or anything about, you know, any of that stuff or optimizers. I'm going to try and keep this reasonably high level. I'm also going to try and keep it somewhat generic, but I'm going to fail at that one. I have some hope of keeping it high level, but it's not going to be as generic as I would like. This is going to be a little bit specific to one compiler that I'm very familiar with, and that's LLVM. Now, my hope is that the concepts and the thought process that you have when you think about optimization in the context I'm going to present transfers pretty well over to other optimizing compilers. I'm, I'm reasonably confident about uh, the transfer to GCC. It's different in some ways, but not in important ways. So I think this will work as a good framework, and, and I want to give you a concrete discussion today. That way, when you ask me really annoying questions, I at least have a small hope of answering them. If it was completely abstract, we wouldn't. So we're going to step through a compiler today. Now, compilers are organized into different layers. People have probably seen a slide like this before, right? You've got a front end. You've got you know, your optimizer. You've got your code generator. Now, I've already started to rock the boat a little bit because a lot of people think of an optimizer as a code generator. And I don't think of an optimizer as a code generator. And this is a somewhat controversial view. And today, what I'm going to be talking about is not really the front end. I'm really going to be focusing on this piece. I'm never going to get to the code generator. I'm sorry if you were looking for that. You'll have to watch a different talk, and frankly, you'll have to find a different person, because I don't really know much about code generation. I know a little bit, enough to be dangerous, not enough to give you guys a talk. So we're going to talk about optimizers, but we have to get into the optimizer first. So let's, let's go through optimization 101. We start off with a lovely C program, right? It's, it's almost C++. It's not really, though. Okay, so this is just an example program. Don't get hung up on the particulars of this program. I needed something that would fit on a slide, okay? 
And in particular, I wanted something that didn't include a header file, so I couldn't use the traditional hello world. This is going to be my hello world. It's kind of a more mathematical one. All right, so pretty straightforward, right? Not too bad. When you compile this, you get something that's a little bit less straightforward. This is the AST that Clang's front end produces. Well, this is the top half of the AST that Clang's front end produces. Unfortunately, it's not very readable. It doesn't make any sense. It's just preposterously complex. From this code, okay? From this code. So this is the AST. It gets a little bit better when you actually bring it down into a representation for the optimizer. So if we bring it down to an optimizer, it's still, it's still, it doesn't really fit on a slide anymore. And I started with such a tiny example, but we're going to work on this, and I'm going to explain what what some of these fundamentals are. All right. So let's 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 take a bit of a digression and actually explain what what this input language is, because this is an input language to an optimizer. All right. It's 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 left the front end. It's going into an optimizer. And for the record, I don't expect anyone to read that slide, okay? You're not missing anything. All right, so how does LLVM actually represent programs that go into its optimizer? It uses a representation called single static assignment, right? Or static single assignment, SSA form. This is a really common uh, representational model for optimizers today. Anyone, anyone know SSA form? Any folks know it? Okay, that's about what I thought. So I'm going to explain SSA form because no, most people don't know it, and you shouldn't know it, but now you will. You can, you, can, you can hate me later. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to define a function, right? That's not too crazy. The syntax is a little goofy, but you can see that we're defining a function here. We have a label. This is going to indicate that we have a basic block. All right, we've got a new basic block. This is going to be executable code. Now we have instructions. Now these instructions are a little bit different from a hardware instruction. Okay, this instruction is called a single static assignment because the instruction actually forms the definition of a named value. Okay, in this case, percent C here, right? The definition of C is this add instruction. C will never take on another value, right? Within this function, C's only possible value is that add instruction, right? And that's, that's what we mean by single assignment, right? It's really, really fundamental. And everything, all of the intermediate representation for LLVM's optimizer gets put into this basic form. A call to another function produces a value, a named value, in this case D, right? And that's, that's the name of the instruction, not just the name of a value. And we have another add, and then we have a ret. This is just returning from the function, right? This is how a function would return a value to the call instruction that calls it. It's making some sense. I don't want to like jet forward if we don't, if we're not, if we're, okay, cool. So then it gets a little bit more complicated because now we need control flow in our intermediate representation. We need some way of representing control flow branching behavior in the intermediate representation. So here we start off again with the function definition. I've added you know, more parameters. You'll see that I've added a, a one-bit parameter. This is a binary flag, not too surprising. We have a basic block. In the basic block, though, we're going to see something new. This is a termination of a basic block. It is a branch instruction. Okay, the branch instruction is a conditional one. It has a conditional variable, this flag. That conditional variable is going to indicate whether we go to this basic block or this other basic block as the next step of execution. Okay, now LVM, LVM's uh, chosen IR is extremely explicit and redundant. You might have noticed this some already with the types, which are repeated everywhere. This really isn't a, a language for humans, right? This is a language for a machine. This is a language for an optimizer, and, and the only time humans look at it is when they're debugging something. And so having it be very explicit and kind of spelled out is actually very useful. Okay, so we have this control flow graph, right? We have an entry basic block. We're gonna branch to either then or to else based on this flag, making some sense. Then we have two different return instructions. This calls out a new interesting aspect of LLVM's intermediate representation. You can return more than once from a function, right? There can be multiple returns, multiple exits from a function. Some intermediate representations choose to have a single entry, single exit. LLVM has single entry, multiple exit, okay? 
All right, one, one more layer of complexity, and this is probably going to be the one that, that kills folks, and we'll have enough of, enough of an understanding of LVM's intermediate representation to really talk about it. Because we need some way to handle data flow around control flow. Okay, so going back, we have control flow here. We have this basic block, the then block, may not be executed. Okay, but what if we need to send different values because of the behavior of this block? We can't just assign a new value to a variable because the, 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 it's not a variable, right? It's a name of a single value. You can't change what it refers to. So instead, in order to form data flow, a uh, single assignment form has this fee instruction down here, okay? The fee instruction is very magical. What it says is that it produces a new value and which value it produces is dependent on which control flow edge enters the basic block. Okay? So if we come from the entry basic block, right, we take the then branch here, we come into the then basic block, right, we go to the end, we see this fee, and in the fee we have this kind of table of potential values for the fee to take on. Because we came from the then as the most immediate predecessor, we take on the percent %d value. So percent %result names the fee instruction, that act of selecting between two branches of control flow for the purpose of data flow. Making some sense? This is how SSA form maps control flow into data flow. Everybody fairly happy with this? All right, you now understand about 50% of LVM's intermediate representation. All right, most of the rest of it's details. Yes? Wait, wait. I'll repeat your question. So, and if you have this, Okay, the question is, what happens when you have nested layers of control flow? How do you actually pull out of it? So once you have nested layers of control flow, right, you're going to have to have a fee node at each point you're going to get an immediate predecessor. Now, if, if you end up with all of the nested control flow all jumping into a single basic block to exit it, no matter how many levels, this fee doesn't have to be binary. It can be in way. However many predecessors this end basic block has, that's how many entries actually must be present in the fee in order to select between them. Does that make sense? Okay. Other questions about fee nodes? Yes. Uh, what is the difference between having a fee node and having two return statements? In this example, absolutely nothing, except that it let me show you fee notes. <laughs> um, there, there are many cases where you don't have returns, you don't want to return, you actually want to continue computing, especially if you imagine a loop control flow instead of just a branching control flow. It gets much harder to express it with a return. But this is just a contrived example, purely a contrived example. Okay, any other clarification questions? I promise you guys you will have some, some time for proper Q&A afterward, but it's important to understand this or the rest of the talk goes downhill. <laughs> the hand go up? No? Everybody good? <laughs> All right. So, I, be, I gotta be careful. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so where were we? We were talking about the intermediate representation we got out of this simple, trivial program. And you guys still can't read this because there's still way too much code here. And the reason there's so much code up here, and most of it doesn't even look like the code I showed you, is because the front end is cheating. It is cheating. All right? And so we're going to have to actually understand why the front end puts out code that looks like this before we can move on. And what, what it really comes down to is that optimization isn't really just about making your program faster. The, the optimization engine is, is actually compensating for design complexity in the front end in order to allow the front end to be very simple and to emit terrible code like this, which may be very easy to emit, the optimizer has special logic in it. Because the first step of the optimizer is cleaning up after the front end. Okay, it has to clean up this mess that we've made. So we started with this nice tiny little function here, very, very simple, and we got this mess of code that doesn't make any sense at all. 
But when you run the basic pieces of the optimizer in LVM, which are responsible for cleaning up after the front end, you get something that's much more reasonable. This is starting to look like what I showed you. There's some more complexities here that we haven't dealt with. We've got load instructions. We've got this weird instruction here, which I'm going to not talk about. It's the single most confusing part of LVM's design. All you need to think about it is array indexing for today. All this is doing is array indexing. There's nothing else going on here. All right, so we've got a little bit more complexity, but fundamentally, we've suddenly arrived at something that actually looks vaguely like the basic IR that I was showing you, okay? And, and this is just the fact that the front end is cheating when it emits IR. It assumes that these cleanup operations are going to happen, that the back end is gonna take care of this for it. Make some sense? Okay. So, Step two of optimization is also a little bit strange. It still isn't really that much about optimization. It's not really about efficiency. The second really important step of optimization is called canonicalization. Now, canonicalization is particularly important to me and to LVM because of a pattern that emerges in any real-world programming language. You can write the same thing in so many, so many different ways, all right? Now, Perl, of course, is famous for this, but really, there's no programming language out there that doesn't suffer from this problem, okay? All of these things are the same fundamental logic, right? But if they come out and they look like slightly different forms of this intermediate representation, you're gonna get different behavior from your optimizer because you happen to have a coding convention that says, don't use a ternary operator, right? Especially with you know, poor taste in white space, right? Don't use a ternary operator. It says to use this if else pattern. Suddenly your optimizer behaves differently. Canonicalization actually allows the optimization framework to assume that there is a single predictable form for every pattern that comes into it. All right. Now, that doesn't actually work out in practice. We can't hit every pattern, but we write the optimization with that assumption. And every time we find new patterns, we find new ways of writing things in the source code or in the intermediate representation, the goal is to teach the canonicalization to pick one canonical form for it and to push everything into that form rather than having to add complexity to each stage of the optimization framework in order to handle different inputs and inputs that shift slightly over time. And so when we, when we go through and we take this input program, which has been cleaned up but has not been canonicalized, we'll see that there's a very small shift here, all right? So that in particular, we have, we have an extra return here, right? We have some redundancies in this program that we can eliminate. And, and canonicalization is all about removing redundancies because most of the non-canonical forms have you know, unnecessary fluff in them. That's actually the most common way that we see unexpected patterns in an intermediate representation for a program. So we remove them, we distill it down to this canonical form. And now, now we've got something that's predictable that's ready to be handed off to the optimizer. Okay. The third really big step of optimizations is collapsing abstractions. And this is where we're gonna kind of get it to dig a little bit deeper, because this is what goes to the idea of emergent structures. Up until now, we've been setting the stage, we've been cleaning things up, getting things ready. But now we have to actually deal with C++ and all of its horror. Okay, so there are three key abstractions. Let's see if I can get away with this with this audience. Can I get with having only three key abstractions in the C++ programming language? Maybe. Well, as far as the optimizer is concerned, it looks like three key abstractions, okay? First, we have calls, function calls. The procedural decomposition of your program is the number one most prominent abstraction that the optimizer has to deal with. A lot of people don't even think about this as an abstraction, but this is really the bread and butter of the optimizer. Almost everything it does falls down on this, this particular abstraction. The second major abstraction the optimizer has to deal with is the fact that you have memory. And memory is this kind of unanalyzed thing. It's a pile of bits. You manipulate it in strange ways. Strange things come out of it. And somehow, your program behaves correctly. And the optimizer has no idea how that works. The third thing are loops. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna talk too much about loops here. Um, we heard a lot more about loops in the previous keynote, and, and frankly, there are a lot of people other than me who can talk much more uh, enlighteningly about loops. Um, because really, who cares about loops in C++, right? I mean, like, we don't, like, loops are, I mean, if you really cared about loops, you would write in Fortran anyways, as we learned yesterday. So, 
okay, it's a little bit tongue in cheek. But the, the real idea is that we're actually really good at optimizing loops by and large compared to some of the other constructs in C++. For the loops we see in C++, we do pretty well, right? And if, if your, your, your favorite optimizer of choice, and believe me, that might be LVM in this case, doesn't optimize loops particularly well, that's actually a bug in the optimizer. We know exactly how to do it. There's no like mystical science. We've been optimizing loops beautifully for decades. Okay, And so I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about optimizing loops because it's just not that interesting. <laughs> All right. There are also a bunch of other fundamentals that someone who, who remembers their optimizer class or their compiler class may be wondering about. You know, what about the CFG? What about you know data flow? All of these things. Those actually aren't that interesting to talk about either because those are largely solved problems. Once you hit an SSA form of your program, data flow and control flow are trivial. Right? They literally fall out of it, and that's why we put programs into that form. This talk is about looking through the challenging abstractions, and most of the other abstractions aren't very challenging anymore. Okay, so let's talk about the first of these. How do we decompose function calls? Now, the first thing I want to do is I want to like kind of explain a call graph, okay? So here we have a lovely a lovely call graph, right? A calls B, B calls C, C calls A. The very first thing to note is that this is not an acyclic graph. There are cycles in any call graph, all right? And that is going to be the first challenge for how do we actually optimize this? How do we analyze a call graph when there are cycles in it? How do we build efficient algorithms for it? And the, the most effective strategy that, that you will find in modern optimizers is something called uh, uh, finding these, and I'm going to blank on the word now, because I'm bad at words. SCCs, anyways. Thank you, strongly connected components. I, all I had was the initials for it. So we have these strongly connected components, which are called throughout the optimizer SCCs, um, because that's not a confusing you know, three-letter acronym to use. Um, so, so they're called SCCs. And the idea of a strongly connected component is that you can actually just remove the cycles from your graph by taking the, the areas of the graph which form cycles, bundling them up into one node, and treating that as a single node. And then you have a DAG. You have a very nice DAG. And in fact, in many cases, you can decompose it all the way down to a tree. And if you look at real C++ programs, if you look at real programs, you don't have cycles which span your entire program. Right? It's very challenging to write that kind of software, especially very large software, which has a cycle that spans the entire program. How many folks here have actually written a call to main? Come on, be honest. Be honest if you've written a compiler test suite. You've written a call to main. OK, there we go. So you can do it, but it's quite challenging to pull off. And so in practice, this actually works great. You end up with very, very small connected components. You end up being able to break everything down and use your directed acyclic graph algorithms. And that's, that's how LVM's call optimizing works. That's how most call optimizing systems work. So once you have this SEC, you're going to have to perform some traversal of it. And what you're trying to do in this traversal is you're trying to collapse function calls. You're trying to remove this call abstraction from the program by looking through it and realizing that there's a simpler representation for the program. All right, so you're going to start, you're going to look at one strongly connected component. You're going to kind of analyze this as a unit. What that really means is that you're going to iterate round and round and round this cycle, trying to decompose it as much as you can because there's no clear starting point. Okay? So it's a little expensive, but remember, real C++ programs, these are very small. And so iterating on them is, is reasonably cheap. You can afford to do this in a compiler. As you optimize each of the strongly connected components, you're going to work from the bottom of the call graph up. And this is really fundamental because once, once we've optimized this strongly connected component, we think that G, H, and I, if they survive our optimization, right? if we actually go and we see this picture of the world, we believe that these three functions are optimized. right? The abstractions in them, where we can remove them, have been removed. Right? If we look at them, there's not going to be a lot of abstractions, a lot of cruft, a lot of things preventing us from understanding what those functions do. 
And that means when we analyze E over here, right, and we're looking at the fact that E is calling G, we're actually going to have the information we need about G to make a reasonable decision of whether this call edge is a good call edge or is actually a needless, needless abstraction and we can inline through that call edge profitably. If G isn't optimized yet, then we have no idea, right? We might look at G and say like, no, we would never up inline G into E here. That would be a terrible decision. But then we end up deleting all of G's code, right? And that actually happens. That's, that's the common pattern. And so it's really, really important that you have this kind of bottom-up progression so that when you make a decision about how to optimize these functions, you do so with a full awareness of all of the state they're going to reach out and touch. Does that make some sense? Okay, and you keep iterating through this, right? You keep bubbling up through the stack as you go. Everything beneath you has been optimized. You have a reasonable understanding of what the costs are. You can make intelligent decisions about how to decompose function calls. Okay, now I've talked about like, you know, evaluating this complexity and, and why it's important to do and what you would do if, if it's cheap enough. But what does cheap enough even mean, right? What are compilers doing here? So let's take an example, right? We've got some C code, we've got F, it's gonna call something. Should we inline this function, right? Who thinks we should inline this function? Uh. Yeah, okay, come on. <laughs> the answer is yes, by the way. We want to inline this function. All this function does is take some arguments, change the order, look through one pointer, and call another function. This is the kind of abstraction which is really useful to programmers, right? Because now you have a different interface than what G accepted, right? Maybe you needed a different interface because there's something that demands this particular interface. This is an incredibly useful programmer abstraction, and it's completely useless when you're actually executing code, right? You never want to execute this, right? You want to inline it into the caller. So this is one of the fundamental patterns that optimizers are looking for, for something that has a low enough complexity worth inlining, something that isn't actually adding functionality, it's simply allowing the programmer to do some notional transformation, right? Something that the caller of F is going to be able to do anyways. All right. There's a second really, really fundamental pattern that we want to detect inside the optimizer when we're inlining, when we're making these complexity decisions for inlining. And that's the idea of some predicated logic, right? So here's my fancy sort, which is very, very clever. Um, it has two glorious optimizations. It optimizes for the empty case, and it optimizes for one element case, and it optimizes for the two element case, right? It's very, very, it's very clever. Now, Unfortunately, I was putting on a slide, and so I just wrote std sort down here. But imagine, right, imagine that your std sort implementation, like a, a certain standard library, which will, you know, be left unnamed, std sort implementation, is marked as always in line. And so before any actual optimizer takes a look at this, this gets expanded to an elaborate, very complex sort algorithm. But you have these two little special cases up here that are very cheap, all right? When, when the optimizer looks at this code, it's not going to inline this function into any caller, right? It's got an enormous algorithm down here. That's not a good candidate for inlining, right? This is a good abstraction boundary, right? This is, this is a place we're sharing code about how to sort this thing. However, there are some contexts in which inlining it is the perfect decision. When we return early here, we have tiny logic, right? We don't want to pay for all of this algorithm. That's why we wrote the special cases. The optimizer really, really wants to detect a contextual signal that means you're in a special case of some you know, predicated algorithm. And just that special case has to be inlined. And that, that can be really, really impactful for performance. This is, this is actually about the most important inlining decision that your optimizer is going to make. If it makes it wrong, you pay very dearly. Actually, inlining it when it shouldn't is the worst thing to do. Okay? So, unfortunately, the optimizer's very clever attempts to do this bottom-up analysis to have, right, the bottom-up analysis to give it the context it needs to make this decision, right, it doesn't always work. There, there, sometimes things get really challenging. And my favorite, my favorite thing which thwarted this, which sadly doesn't fit on a slide very well, so there's some, some, some blocks of pseudo-ness here, 
is a hash implementation. This is something actually, this is, this is from real code now. So if you imagine you wanted to write a, a hashing routine, which was nice and very attic, you could just like hand it a bunch of arguments and it would zip them all together and compute some hash value for you, right? This seems like a, a nice library. This is something we actually needed. And so you write, because you're writing this equals plus 11, right? You write this very nice thing. This is, a, this is beautiful code, right? When you actually write this, it's beautiful code. But there's, there's some complex stuff here, right? There's, there's a big algorithm for how you have to finalize the hash value, right? There's a bunch of code for how you need to mix the bits of the argument into the hash state, right? There's a lot of fiddly code in here. It turns out to be about 10 to 20 lines of C++ code. It expands to about 100 to 500 instructions of x86 assembly. It's, it's, it's got, it's, it's got a little bit of weight to it, okay? And what that really means is when the optimizer sees this, it sees something that's a little bit surprising. It doesn't see these two kind of isolated functions. No, no, no. This is a variadic template. It sees a recursive expansion of calls, right? This, form, this, this little call here is the devil, okay? Because what it does is it inserts an arbitrary number of layers between the leaf of this chain, which might, you know, say what this final value is, and where the caller is. So if you call this function with 500 arguments, it will do the right thing, but it will do it very slowly. There will be 500 function calls along the way. And when the optimizer sees this, it never has a really good opportunity to make the right decision because the optimizer starts from the bottom up, right? It starts on this one and it says like, well, you've got some complex logic here. It seems kind of reasonable to not inline that function. Okay, then it moves up one layer of this kind of recursive decomposition. It looks at that layer. It has no new information at this point. You've got, you've got a nice meaty bit of logic, right? You call down to a function with a meaty bit of logic, and you're being called by a function with a meaty bit of logic. There's no new information here. You have to bubble all the way up the stack, all the way up to the very first caller to hash, to notice that, in fact, all of these arguments are constants. All of this math, constant folds. The computation of this value is something that happens at, or should happen at compile time. There's no need to call a runtime function here, okay? But it's very hard to see that when you're doing a bottom-up traversal. Got a question at the very back. Oh, yes. Sorry, the question is, you know, isn't this tail recursion, right? We don't have to actually recurse here. We can loop. But we didn't want to loop. We wanted to compute the answer. Like, I don't want to go around a loop 500 times. I don't want to call a function 500 times. I simply want the number 42 back. All right? That's, that's the fundamental problem we have here. So... The, the thing that you have to realize is that you've done this bottom-up traversal, and that's actually not enough. And so all of the major optimizers have some top-down pass as well in their inliner. So that when they get to the very, when they get to the very top call here to hash, and they see that, like, oh wow, you passed in, you know, a bunch of constants, and I can simply compute the result of that, that they'll actually go back down through all of the calls for which that holds, inline all of them, do the constant propagation, actually reconstitute everything. Everything. And that's a really important thing. Like, one strategy alone isn't going to be enough here. All right. So that's, that's, that's some of the complexities of, of optimizing function calls, the abstractions of function calls. But there's more, because that's only one of our two abstractions we're going to talk about. So, so now let's talk a little bit about memory as an abstraction model. All right, so memory as an abstraction model, it, it, it mostly has to do with loads and stores. And not just any loads and stores. So we'd have to do with very particular loads and stores. Most of the memory that your optimizer is working on isn't memory that you, know, you the programmer, see, right? You didn't write new somewhere. The memory the optimizer sees is the memory on the stack for your variables, for your automatic variables, for things that you know, C++ has managed entirely for you. And you have no awareness that there's memory attached here. That's the memory that the compiler is mostly facing, all right? And so this is what memory for the optimizer really looks like, okay? So we're going to start here on the left, and this is, this is an unoptimized piece of, you know, the IR going in with lots of memory in it. 
Okay, so the first thing we have to do is we have to allocate the memory. We have special allocation routine for doing a stack allocation. That's not too surprising, right? This isn't something that you called malloc for. We own the memory entirely, right? We do some computations and we store into it. Okay, then we have control flow. And inside the control flow, we have a function call, we have another store, we have more control flow, and then we load the result out of memory and we get the right answer. This is actually the predecessor to one of my examples with fee notes. Right? This, is, this is what you would actually start with from the, from the compiler. When we're trying to analyze this, what we need to do is we need to do a very clever transformation, which is SSA value formation. We need to look at the allocation, the stores, and the loads, and propagate those values, look at the control flow structure, and form fee nodes to represent a data flow structure, and turn these into SSA values. Right? And this is, this is one of the most fundamental optimization passes in any optimizing compiler. Right? And what it does, it's going to produce this fee node IR that we've looked at before. Okay? Because what it saw is it saw a store, saw another store, and it saw that those two stores merged at a certain point in the CFG. At that merge point, it inserts a fee node, and it has those fee nodes consume the stored values. Then when it sees a load after the merge point of the CFG, it knows to actually have the load consume the fee node value rather than either of the stored values. Once it's done that, it's replaced the stores and the loads with actual SSA values. Now there's just a dead allocation and it deletes the allocation. Right? That's, that's the very basic rudimentary algorithm that's followed for actually forming something that we can analyze that doesn't actually load and store to memory. Unfortunately, real code, like, this is very nice, I can explain how SSA formation works here, but real code never looks like this, right? Your real code looks like something significantly more complex, and unfortunately, too complex to really see easily. What's going on here, if you can kind of squint at it, is up at the top, we're defining a structure of four elements. There are four values here. And now, rather than actually accessing a single value stored in a single place in memory that we can simply promote in this SSA formation manner, we're actually indexing through memory. We're actually going into an array, indexing. These are memory operations here. We're looking inside of it. We're, we're storing at different locations in memory. We're loading at different locations in memory. All right. You can't do a trivial SSA formation pass to reconstruct the actual data flow of this program. Instead, you have to first decompose the actual use of memory. And the way we decompose it is through partitioning. We look at each of the partitions of the memory, which are loaded and stored to, we line those up, we give them their own piece of memory, and then the SSA, uh, the SSA formation that we had in the last slide works in this one as well. And if you do that three times, you get the result here. Right? All this has done is it's you know, split apart the memory and then formed SSA values for each piece of the memory. And we have to keep doing this. This is the kind of the divide and conquer way in which the optimizer is going to take structures, classes, stores into various members, loads from them in control flow, and, and build up something that is actually analyzable. Okay. Now, not all memory is this, you know, compiler, you know, aware stack allocation, and, and some of it is actually just memory. And for all of those things, we actually have a very large body of literature about how to actually optimize it, but none of those are actually going to do an abstraction decomposition. Once, once, you, once you escape the memory, all these algorithms are going to do is they're going to see stores and loads to memory, and they're going to compute what value was loaded. They get, right? Some loads they'll be able to do that, other loads they won't be able to do that, and the memory will be left alone. Right? Any time that we're actually going to break down the memory and remove it, it's going to end up looking something like this, where we end up with SSA values due to partitioning and actually SSA formation. Okay. So, the final thing that I really, really want to talk about here, and this, this may take a little bit more time, is what exactly happens when these abstractions combine. So it turns out that 
most of the optimization challenges that I see in C++ code don't stem from either one or the other of the two abstractions I've described. Because we have a really good idea of how to optimize them now. I've presented some of those ideas. The real challenges come when these abstractions overlap. And this is where there's some interesting questions here. So the first example, and this is, this is a very trivial example, but I'm trying to drive home a point, so, so bear with me on that. Right, so the trivial example here is when you have an output parameter. Right, when you're not using value semantics, you're actually passing in a reference, and you're just letting someone set it, and you're collecting that output parameter. Because the thing to think about here, and, and sadly, showing you how this gets compiled doesn't fit on the screen as nicely as C++ does, is that this reference that we're taking that's actually taking the address, right? And we're taking that address and we're passing it to some other function. So now we have memory, this, this C integer in the first function, right? And so we have one abstraction the optimizer struggles with. And we're taking the address of that memory and we're handing it to another function, right? And so the memory abstraction intersects with the function boundary abstraction. And that means that the optimizer is very, very constrained in how it can deal with this. Now, if you're lucky and you have these tiny functions, right, everything gets inlined, everything vanishes, and, you know, your world is it's beautiful. But the, these aren't tiny functions in practice. In practice, these are massive pieces of code. And the fact that you have this, this output parameter passed in by reference or by pointer, this doesn't matter, right, that means that you have memory that the optimizer can't analyze. And this is extremely annoying for, for the optimizer. The way optimizers handle this today is through a, a guess, a heuristic. Every optimizer I know of, when it sees this pattern, this call, where it passes in the address of a local variable to some other function, it says, well, try extra hard to inline that function. Because if you can inline that function, even if it wasn't really the best function to inline, then I can go and delete a memory allocation in my function, and that's really, really useful, right? Then I can form an SSA value and get data flow information in my function, and that's really, really useful, right? This, this has really far-reaching impacts. It, it keeps going though, right? Because inside of G, you have a problem because you have this reference. This reference could be to anything. It could be to A, it could be to B, right? That makes it a lot harder to understand what this operation does and how you're allowed to compute it, right? There are different choices that you have to make now. So, so these are the kind of trade-offs that the optimizer has to make once you intersect a memory construct and the procedure boundary. And the, the thing that frustrates me the most about this particular pattern is that there is such an easy and obvious way to avoid it. Yes, Dave? In this case, can C really refer to A or B passed by value? Uh, no, not in this case, for sure. I, again, I want something that would fit on the slide. It, it's a giant, there are classes in here with this pointers that unfortunately it could refer to. Yeah, so let's have them be const references. Yeah, and, and, you're, and then your host. So, so the, but the, the frustration is that you don't need output parameters. We have value semantics in C++, and whether this is an int or a class or whatever else it might be, you can return it by value, and this problem doesn't exist, okay? And so anytime you see someone arguing that, like, no, 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 I'm not going to return by value because the copy would cost too much, all right? Someone working on an optimizer says they're wrong, all right? <laughs> I have never yet seen a piece of code where that argument was correct, all right? I've seen it made a lot of times, and in many cases, that argument was valid if you left the code in the completely brain-dead and broken design which it came to you in, but by fixing other things in the code, you can always get to a point of returning by value, using value semantics, and having perfectly reasonable performance, okay? And that's, that's very, very fundamental. People don't realize how important value semantics are to the optimizer, because it completely clarifies the aliasing scenarios, and it makes it much, much easier to understand whether or not this int c can be destroyed by inlining. Okay, I have one, one more somewhat complex and point of intersection one. And this one I think is actually the worst thing that I've ever had to optimize. Um, 
This is a this is a not uncommon pattern. You define a class which contains lots and lots of members because it's some very complex you know operation you're going to do, and one method on this class, right? And this, this method takes no arguments at all. Sometimes it's the constructor. That one really frustrates me. Um, but uh, the other one that's more common and is less frustrating is when it's operator parens. Oh, sure, yes. So, so the question is, um, if you're returning by value and you move, and you use move semantics uh, from C++11. The effect is that if there were a copy required without move semantics, you would instead get a move. That's it. That's the beauty of move semantics, in fact. They don't actually change anything else. They just mean that some of the times when you needed to have a copy, now you don't need to have a copy because you know that the old value is going away. We like that. Another question. The question is the question is if you if you add const in here and and you don't mutate things how does that how does that change things so those are two separate questions, unfortunately. Adding const doesn't help anyone at all in the optimizer. Const doesn't exist at the optimizer because const cast exists in the language. So it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, except for globals, yes, and okay. Um, but to answer the other half of the question, which is if you don't change it, that actually does have an effect. One of the very important optimizations that, that many optimizing compilers will do is that they will analyze a function body and they'll add compiler and optimizer specific annotations to say like, this, there, there's a reference here, right? But I actually don't mutate it at all. It's actually not an output parameter, it's an input parameter, and that helps the analysis of the caller. Um, it doesn't completely solve the problem, but it helps. And so, like, I don't have a huge problem with const reference parameters um, because usually, when programmers are well behaved, they don't modify it. The compiler can see that they don't modify it and can actually tell that to the caller. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay, so to try and summarize that, um, it sounds like I'm, I'm essentially pushing back against all reference or pointer um, parameters in a general case because it makes it harder to optimize. And is there any, is there any different pattern that we should take? It, it's, it's clearly necessary sometimes to have reference parameters. What, what strategy, like how should you make choices about it? Is that a good summary? Okay, so the, the tricky thing here is that to an extent, yes, I am saying that I don't like reference and pointer parameters. I, I would like to see them avoided where possible or where reasonable, but that doesn't mean that it's always reasonable, even from a performance stance, right? And, and the, the kind of the extreme example is an R value reference. There are a lot of cases where accepting an R value reference is tremendously more efficient. Right? And so, and there may even be semantic reasons why you need to accept a reference. I, I don't want to say don't do this. What I want to say is be aware of the cost of doing this. Now for a lot of functions, the cost of passing by reference doesn't matter that much. It's not a big deal. And when it isn't a big deal, you should pick whatever makes your API you know, beautiful and easy to program against. But Throughout our code base and throughout every conversation I've had with programmers who have not worked on an optimizer, I have consistently heard people espouse this wisdom that if you want to avoid copies, pass in an output parameter instead of returning by value. And it's that specific pattern that I want to eradicate. And so uh, I just wanted to point out one thing, uh, which is to tie together a couple of things you said. One of the things is that that frustration that people often feel with the inability of the C++ compiler to optimize based on const is actually addressed by passing by value. 
in a lot of cases. Yes. I mean, so the thing is, the, the reason the compiler can't optimize based on const is because it doesn't know that things aren't aliased. It doesn't know that somebody else doesn't have a non-const reference to the same value, right? And And as soon as you start passing things by value, then you know you have a unique value, a unique object, and it can do those optimizations. Absolutely. So people need to change their head about, about where optimizations come from. Which is the point. <laughs> I mean, we can skip to the end now, but I have a couple of more slides that'll at least be entertaining, I hope. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not sorry at all. Like, that is the point. Okay. So, okay. Any other, any other uh, questions or comments about this one? Because this one is one of the more interesting ones. We can stay here as long as you guys want. Yes, we have an, another question. So, is new semantics the time of semantics you have to be able to see plus plus elements? The question is, um, in C++11, there, there are provisions for automatic move semantics, um, and uh, are those only enabled by turning on compilation in C++11, or do those actually show up when compiling in normal C++98 mode? And the only answer I have is that it depends. Uh, at a fundamental level, you know, yes, you have to turn on move semantics in your implementation to get automatic move semantics. Whether that requires turning on C++11 or not is up to the implementation. For example, um, I, I believe in Microsoft's implementation, they always are in C++11 mode, and they, they've never acknowledged that there were two modes. So, Right? Um, in Clang, uh, I think certain parts of move semantics are enabled as an extension by default. You can still turn them off if you want to be pedantic, but uh, there are lots of implementations which do have extensions on by default. I don't think it's going to matter, though, because most of the places where you have automatic move semantics, and Dave, correct me if I've missed one, uh, most of the places you have automatic move semantics, you also have copy constructor elision. And so, Previously, in C++ 98, what compilers were doing were systematically eliding copy constructors. And in C++ 11, what we said was, it's not a, a choice, you have to, it's a move, right? And, and so, there shouldn't be a huge performance swing. I would not expect one from implicit moves. Uh, so, in, in order to call a move constructor, you need to have our value references, at least. Yes. So that requires a post C plus plus ninety eight Yeah. What Dave was saying is that to have move semantics, um, you, you have to enable our value references. And that, that's what I was trying to drive at. That like, whether it's on by turning on a C++11 flag or on as an extension, you have a language something from C++11 active in your compilation if you're getting move semantics. But that may not matter in terms of performance. That may just be like benchmark it and see. Other questions? Another question on that. In the most common case where you don't get the copy edition, you might profit from the loop and it return a argument. The most API that does not have by uh, so the, the comment is that the common place where automatic move semantics fire and copy edition do not is when returning arguments. Yes, question at the back. Yes. Okay, so, so the question is, the question is, um, what, what is the impact of library boundaries? Potentially a library boundary between F and G, which prevents the compiler from seeing both the definition of F and the definition of G in the same compilation and the optimizer from responding to them. Um, and to answer that first part of the question, um, 
Well, that, that will prevent many things. In particular, if, this, if, if, if you had const reference arguments here and you never mutated them and the definition of G isn't visible, then we're going to have to assume that you const cast away, you mutate them, you, you know, store them to a global variable, you do all kinds of naughty, naughty things to them. Right? We even have to assume that you're also you know, calling printf and acquiring mutexes. It's very, very unfortunate when we don't see the definition of your function. Right? This is the least of the things you lose when we don't see the definition of your function. Okay? So it's a real problem, but it's not isolated to this. This doesn't make it particularly worse or better. When you don't see the definition of the function, you can't optimize based on it. And, and there are just tremendous things that are lost as a consequence. Now, the follow-up question was whether in LVM there are techniques to recapture those optimization opportunities by doing optimization during the link phase. And, and for that, I have to back up because I haven't talked about compiler versus linker or when the optimizer may or may not be running, right? I presented a very simple and simplistic model of there is an optimizer and it sees two functions. We can get into uh, link time optimization and like multi-pass optimization, but I don't know whether we want to do that or not. It's a kind of a different topic. And so I would at least like to say, let's finish this talk. And if we run out of questions, please put your hand back up because I'm happy to talk about that as long as we have time for it. Okay, and I saw another hand earlier. Yes. So the question, if I understand you correctly, and I want to make sure I did, um, is why don't we provide some other qualifier besides const, which actually has the semantic contract the optimizer is looking for, which is that this, this, this is not mutated in any way. Okay. Uh, it's actually a much more complex constraint that the optimizer wants, which Dave was hinting at when he said that passing by value solves all of these problems. Um, what, what the compiler really wants to know is a whole collection of things. First off, do you mutate the value stored at that pointer? Secondly, do you increment from this pointer to some other address and mutate values over there? Do you store this pointer into a global, allowing other functions called potentially on other threads to mutate the values stored there? Um, all of these questions are, are concerning. And then it may even want to know something um, in the inverse. And this is a question that the optimizer wants to know when looking at G. Not when looking at a call to G, but the definition of G, it may want to know, well, you handed me a reference to this integer, and you said that I couldn't mutate it, you said that I couldn't store the pointer address into a global, and that I couldn't index off of it and mutate other things, but you didn't tell me whether or not this is the same integer as some other integer I'm trying to reason about, right? Or much worse, some other thing that isn't an integer, okay? And, and so, so there's a whole host of problems you have to solve. Now, it's possible, it is possible that we could design a, a set of qualifiers to encapsulate all of these different constraints. There are at least two of the constraints you're looking for in those optimizer internal annotations that I mentioned that, that the optimizer will actually deduce from looking at the function and add for you. But genuinely, if we actually came up with all of them, and if you actually used all of them, you would have satisfied all of the constraints for passing by value. And so we come back around to value semantics. And I think that's, that's the circle we're going to keep going around again. At that point, why not pass by value? Is it because of a copy? That seems an unlikely argument against it. Okay. How does the speak Okay, so the hard questions come out. So, anyone here believe that they understand the restrict keyword? <laughs> this is the most wise audience I have ever given a talk to. <laughs> I will make a guess. <laughs> So what the restrict keyword means, first off, depends on who you talk to, um, and it depends on whether you're talking about C or C++. And C++, it means 
a debatable anything because it's actually only defined in C and whether or not it's defined in a part of C that C++ is implicitly including or not is debatable because it has to do with pointer semantics and C++ goes on to re-specify all the pointer semantics itself and doesn't mention restrict. So you've already got a problem here. Now, if you just assume, that, like, no, 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 just grandfather the restrict bits of C into C++, you have a second problem because the restrict bits of C are written in a formal mathematical form, which I believe two people on the C committee understand, max, in the world. And it essentially boils down to when you are inside of G's definition and you have a restrict pointer argument, and you have another restrict, imagine there's a restrict and an asterisk here. And you have another restrict and another asterisk here. All right, and inside of this definition, you would like to know, does this pointer point to equivalent memory as this pointer? Now, I chose my words very carefully there. Equivalent memory is a very preposterous thing to try and define. We'll come back to that. So the goal of restrict is to allow the optimizer to say, if you store into the memory at A, you don't have to assume that B's, the, the, the values stored at B's and B's memory changed. That's their goal, and that's what they achieved, but they did it in a very surprising way, because it doesn't mean that these two pointers are unequal. And in fact, you can compare the two pointers, and in fact, that comparison can produce both true and false for equality in conforming programs using the restrict keyword. Which becomes very confusing, because what you have now said is that these pointer values, the addresses at these, like the addresses past this function, are bit for bit identical, but the memory they refer to can be assumed to be distinct. And that's an okay thing in the restrict world, because at the end of the restrict paragraph is this little clause which says essentially, if you, if you do one of a number of things which opt you out of restrict, then the restrict doesn't apply. And so, unless your function actually stores through a restrict pointer, the restrict keyword has no effect. That requirement is not a static requirement, it is a dynamic requirement, which means that you can call a function with two restrict qualified pointers. And if you dynamically know that the arguments you happen to be giving to it will cause the store through one of those restrict pointers to not be live, you can give it two pointers which alias. Do you see the problems here? So um, what restrict does here is uh, absolutely nothing because you only have one thing with restrict on it and so it doesn't tell you anything. If we added another thing with restrict on it, it would tell you something if and only if there's a store through the restrict qualified pointer. And it would tell you something quite surprising because it would tell you you don't need to reload a value stored at the other pointer. It doesn't tell you anything actually about the address values of those pointers. Turns out restrict value, restrict is, as a qualifier is very narrowly useful. I don't really recommend it. Other questions? Or did that just like kill the room? Uh, what do you think about turning C instead of having in G instead of pick up one turn with the uh, in turn? That was my suggestion. But you leave uh, everything. Why would you? Oh. I mean, <laughs> you can, <laughs> but to what purpose? So that you have, for example, like a get, and you use that get see out statement. So you have to do it in two lines. For example, get C, and then you can use the same see out. I think you're optimizing for the wrong thing at that point. Um, I, I think that, that a simpler, clear interface and is, is worth a line of code. And I don't think you'll actually have to pay a line of code because I think there are other ways to achieve what you're trying to achieve. But even if there weren't other ways to achieve what you're trying to achieve, I think the simpler interface is worth a line of code. Um, holistically. Other questions? And then I want to at least take a little bit of time for, for the other example here. I love the questions, though. That was what I was hoping for. 
except for the restrict one. <laughs> okay. So the other problem that I've, I've run into that I, I think is really interesting kind of intersection of these abstraction boundaries is this problem where you have a class, you build up a bunch of members in the class, then you call a, a, a kind of single function on it, either you know a compute, a do, a run, an operator, parens, whatever it happens to be. And then your call sites look something like this. And this is, and I've tried to kind of elaborate why you might write code like this, okay? You have some really complex computations to figure out these arguments. And again, you don't want to copy the arguments because that would kill performance. Therefore, you create this structure which can hold all of them first. You compute all of these arguments and stash them away in the structure, and then you go off and you call your method. And it does it can just like look at the member functions. This is a this is a fabulous piece of code, particularly because it looks so clean. All right? There's, there's, no, there's no cruft here. At least this one looked a little bit goofy because I had this output parameter thing. But this actually looks pretty reasonable. I'm returning by value. I'm doing the right things here. And, and yet, this is, this is actually much harder to optimize because we need to think through all of the abstractions of C++ to understand what's happening here. When we declare S, we get a structure of memory somewhere. So we don't care about where, but we do get memory, right? We get the, one of those abstractions that, that optimizers have to work to decompose. We then go and, and store things into this memory, read them back out of the memory, store new things into other parts of the memory, lots of reads and writes here. And you remember, this was the more complex case I gave for how, how you might have to decompose memory. But then you do something just, just really annoying. You, you call a method. And by calling a method, even though there's no, there's no address of, there's no reference here, this, this little pesky dot has taken the address of S because it has to produce a this pointer. That's the only way that the definition of compute, you know, pages though it may be, the only way the definition of compute can reference all of this data that we've handed it is through a this pointer, which means we have to take the address of S, which means that the address now is a thing, like it's escaped. We can't delete this allocation and turn these into SSA values. We can't form nice data flow over it because at some point we are going to call a function, take the address of it, and just pass the address of the entire structure to that function. That's what this is really doing here. It's like there's a function that accepts an ad a pointer as its first argument, and literally, when you when you compile it, that's what you get. Yes. Isn't it like a function that accepts four pointers? Nope. I mean, you got pointers to X, Y, Z, and Delta. All. Nope. Oh, one pointer. I I know, I know what code gets generated. Okay. But my point is. So Dave's point is that like, isn't this just as bad as if I had gotten rid of this S and a dot and written a you know global compute call and passed you know references for all of these local variables to it? And the answer is it's, it's significantly worse. Which is a little bit surprising at first. And the reason that it's significantly worse is that you know, if, if we were to pass individual pieces, then at least we would be able to differentiate between x being assigned to here, read here, and passed into the function here. We wouldn't have a layer of indirection when there's a, a pointer that you can index off of. Remember I mentioned that indexing off of a pointer is yet another complexity we have to deal with. So when you, when, you, when you do this this pointer, the thing that really is just deeply frustrating is that now, inside of the compute, all of the things which you might expect to have in the form of context to make decisions about like, well, should I inline, should I not inline, right? Is this a constant, right? Does my math fold away into nothing or not? All of it's not just hidden behind a pointer, it's hidden by two layers of pointers. All right? And so reconstructing the actual argument value, the context in which this function call occurs in order to be able to d intelligently decide whether inlining it or not inlining it is the right decision to make is extraordinarily complicated. Right? It requires a, a, a very significant amount of analysis and usually it's not tractable to do. 
Um, in this case, we would get very lucky and it might be tractable. The thing that I didn't, I should have written up here is, imagine that this has a predicate on it. We only write to delta in some cases. Right? Some of the time we write to delta, other times we don't. Once that happens, because we use x, y, and z in the write to delta, we will forcibly separate the call to this function from the things which it is predicated on by not just you know, a pointer or two pointers, but by pointers and control flow. With no data flow, no, no, no SSA values, nothing to help you actually figure out what the context would actually be. Um, and this actually shows up in real code, it shows up frequently, and the optimizer gives up, goes home, and cannot help. Um, this, is, this is a problem that persists today. We have lots of ideas about how to solve this problem. They all are terrible, they're slow, and they don't catch a large number of real world cases. And so, if, if I can convince you of anything, it's that this was not a good pattern, right? Create local variables, Pass those local variables by value if you can, by const reference if you must. The optimizer will have tremendously more options to go and optimize your code. Okay, we had some hands go up. I saw your hand quite a bit earlier. Yeah. Just thing, if, if, if Dave's version with four reference parameters below, you a big disadvantage of the final task in the computer implementation. So, so the comment is that in this case, the, the, the implementation of compute at least has some special information that says, well, these, these four things are distinct. And, and if you pass them by reference, it won't have that information. That's not always true, sadly. Um, <laughs> because the thing you don't know is you don't know what the this pointer actually points to, and you don't know what other things point to the this pointer. So even though you know that a store to X doesn't alias a store to Z, you don't actually know what things do alias it. And so essentially every alias in computation is going to fail, and, and regardless of the stores to X or Y or Z. I wasn't So, so the, 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 the comment is that optimizers typically ask, does A alias B? Yes. But when it asks that, B is not going to be any of these things in many cases. It's going to be some intermediate pointer, some fee node, something that's been computed through control flow, and we won't actually know what it is in, in the majority of cases. All right. There was a hand over here some time ago, and then I'm just going to have to start picking hands at random. So the question is, does object-oriented engineering inhibit optimization in general, or is this a special case? This is very much a special case. Um, so, so the specific thing I'm trying to get across here is that when you have values, right, which are the direct inputs to a function. Don't invent a new abstraction to give them to that function because optimizers are much better at using the boring abstractions. Now, when you actually need an object because you have lots of methods and it has lifetime and, and those methods interact, that's when you should use it and it's fine and, and that's never going to really cause the kinds of problems that this is going to cause. Right? The really horrible thing is that programmers will write code like this and expect it to optimize in the exact same ways as a function call would optimize in that if they set everything to zero, they expect this to fold away to nothing. But that may not happen. right? And so, so the, the risk is that this appears to be a lightweight tool, not a heavyweight tool. I have no problem with heavyweight object-oriented programming. I have a problem with adding abstractions when they aren't really needed, when we already had very useful abstractions for this. Right? Values and arguments to functions, we don't need to try and replace those. Right? That's, that's what I'm driving at. All right, I'm going to go right to left. Yeah, just you, where you see this a lot is when someone says, you know, oh, if this, this function is getting kind of big, it's taking six, seven arguments in some of them, or they start doing overloads. Just take all the arguments, throw them in a struct so that we simplify the API. And like, yeah, what big six arguments? Yeah. 
the comment is that this often comes up in refactoring as, as methods grow large, as a means to cope with size of methods. And, and Tony was saying to just take six arguments if you need six arguments. My argument, my, my statement would be, maybe you need two functions. <laughs> It's like, I think that you might be refactoring the wrong thing if you're solving the argument problem and not the function problem. All right, coming along, we have more questions. Um, so if we had compute as a free function that took in an S by value, yes. that doesn't help at all? Uh, that actually does help. So, sorry, sorry. Uh, to repeat the question, um, the question is, if, if you had compute as a free function and it accepted by value, but accepted a struct like s by value, is that enough to actually help? And it absolutely is. Um, looking through by value aggregate argument passing is tremendously easier than dealing with pointers, right? Because we can form SSA values all the same and we can actually reason about them using the same data flow techniques. The reason for passing a struct is also have some and you have say three arguments today, but very soon you might have four. Maybe and usually you might have four. That's the reason to have some structure. Pretty much all of this. Absolutely. So, so John's saying that there, there, are, there, are, there are higher level reasons why you might want to pass some abstract entity rather than passing specific arguments. But you can still do it by value. And when you do it by value, you get all of the benefits here. It doesn't matter how you split up the struct. It matters whether it's by value or by pointers. Dave's shaking his head. Yes, I know that it won't end up being passed by value sometimes. No, that's not but, my head. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> all right, yes. Say that one again. Uh, a tuple is the same as a struct. There's no, uh, as far as the optimizing is concerned, there's no difference. There are a pile of differences in how you build tuple, but th that's, a, that's, that's a topic for a talk about optimizing tuple, not a talk for anything else, because it's, it's a unique problem to tuple. Uh, my question is, what if you had like, a, what if you did with like, this relates like lambda, lambda, like, like, you know, you might not do this, but you might go x equals something y equals something z equals something. Capture X, Y, Z, delta into your lambda computer and pass it off to something. Or pass, I mean, it, it's creating like a struct behind the scene, right? Correct. So, so lambda capture, uh, so the question is how does it interact with lambda capture, specifically when you might have implicit capture that looks very much like what I've described here. And the answer is that it is the same with one huge difference, that um, especially if it's implicit capture, the compiler is free to, to um, cheat and to cheat beautifully because it can create a struct with special annotations that talk about exactly what the constraints are. And it can even detect when, you know what, you actually don't need to capture by reference. You're gonna capture by value anyways. As long as you can prove the as if rule, right, the compiler has a great deal of freedom. When you write the code like this, you actually remove a lot of the freedom from the compiler to do those transformations, right? That's, that's part of the problem. So right my, back. my question is about uh, on return path as well. Uh, in case of tuples, you could use tuples and a tie. Uh, you know, that's kind of common pattern with tuples to you know, return multiple things at the same time. So is that uh, a similar problem on um, when you return, or is it only going into the function, not coming out? So, so the the question is, you know, right about tuples and using tuples in, in place of uh, multiple return values, right? And and fundamentally, as long as you're using value semantics, there's hope. Even if the compiler isn't broken, to, is, is broken today, multiple return values and aggregate return values in, in, in compilers today and in optimizers today are very poorly handled. Oh, like so, if you test this, you will see bad things. Okay, but you should write code that way because it's the right way to write the code, and we can fix the compilers. We can fix the optimizers here because the reason that it's bad today isn't a good reason. There's no theoretical reason. There's no extrinsic reason. It's just that, well, unfortunately, we designed return values in the optimizers based around C, and that was bad. Right. So, so th I, I, there's a bit of a caveat there, but it shouldn't impact kind of how you write code. Or not. If you have the ability to make a dynamic decision, sort of like self optimization to self-hardware, could you make some of these code a little bit better? 
so, so I believe what you're asking is, you know, uh, could you defer some of the decisions I've talked about being hard at compile time and, and make those decisions at runtime? Um, yes, uh, the, the, this is kind of the classic argument for why JITs will be faster than static compilers. Um, and to date, I don't know of any JITs for C++ that are faster than static compilers for C++. Um, yes, in theory, it should happen. In practice, uh, static compilation makes preposterously good decisions. Uh, you mentioned earlier about a top-down phase that that could be used to fold away entire calls because you've yes. got constants. And that brought up for me, uh, you know, I've been struggling with this since, since the whole thing was proposed. Why do we really need const expert? So why do we need const expert? We need const expert for when you want a compiler error message if it's not const. If it's not folded, so so my my, my impression of the, the 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 only reason left for const expert is to is an enforcement, not an enabling. In that case, there's a whole there's the largest category of uses of const expert we don't need, like the ones on function art. Um, so, so the response being that that means most of the use cases for const expert aren't necessary. Um, if what you mean by that, if, if what you see as most of the uses of const expert are for optimization purposes, is that an accurate assessment? No, I was addressing what, what you said. If the only reason to have const expert is so that you get an error when something turns out not to be compiled that done, then we don't need the thing on the on function parameters because the constant folder will have Okay. Right? Okay. So, so, so the idea is that we could simplify the context per specification tremendously by actually relying on the folder and just producing an error when it doesn't work. I think this is a discussion we should have not about optimizations and about context per. Context per is fundamentally a semantic thing. Like, it's a semantic part of the language, and optimizations are not. They're operating within the semantic model. They're not contributing to it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of issues there. Um, I, I don't want to get bogged down in it. Um, yes, yes, let's talk later. And, and I'm going to defer your question for a moment because I have like three other slides, and, it's, and we're out of time. So tips for what to do to make your APIs optimize better. Use value semantics. I don't know that I've said it enough times, despite saying it the entire talk. Use value semantics, people. It really actually is the correct solution to most of your optimization problems. Don't create unnecessary abstractions. I'm not saying to not create abstractions. I started off the talk you know, waxing about how wonderful it is that we can build abstractions in C++. Keep building abstractions, just the necessary ones. right? Abstractions for their own sake isn't a good thing, and it hurts the optimizer. And Please, when you're building recursive variadic templates, partition the logic out of that. Recursive variadic templates form the largest, most impenetrable call graphs in your entire program, I guarantee you, because that's their job, right? Their job isn't to do work. Don't do work inside of them. Separate these two things out. The optimizer will, will thank you for that. Okay, um, and and fu the fundamental thing here is right. Use the abstractions, but when they're appropriate, it's 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 really really important. When you're writing a function, it's just a function. That's okay. You don't need to make it into a class. It's, it's okay to have functions in your code and classes. They can coexist. It's the beautiful thing about C++. So. We're, we're, we're like, I think, right out of time, um, but I'm going to take as many questions as you want, and you know, we can run over into break however long people want to run over into break. Um, sure, go ahead. You already had your hand up. Can you go back two slides to the struct this? So, let's, let's say it's struct this and contain the, a huge matrix. Do you still advocate? Well, say that again? Let's say struct S contains a huge matrix. Like it's dynamically allocated one. Okay. Would, you still, would you still advocate passing it by value to compute? 
So, so the question is, you know, if, if we have struct and it's enormous, dynamically sized, lots of complexity in it, do you still pass it by value? Well, that depends. Does compute actually need to own that struct? That's one question, right? If it does, then probably at least by value or by our value reference, right? Um, does the struct need to persist past the call to compute? If no, then absolutely, pass it by value. That's awesome. Anytime you can consume something, I don't care how big it is, that's what Move Semantics gave us. We, we got license to stop worrying about that. Now, if you're going to need to have your struct and keep it around for a while, and you're going to need to call this function on it, maybe call other functions on that, you know, that accept the same struct, you may not want to pass it by value because you may incur many, many copies that's, that's prohibit prohibitively expensive. But most of the time I've seen this code, like the overwhelming majority of the times that I've seen this pattern, all of this struct was building up to a single function call. And as soon as that function call was made, they were done with all of the members, no matter how big they were. Whenever that's the case, yes, you should pass it by value. Just disagree with you on one point. You said that if we don't need struct S on the code compute, pass it by value what you are saying. Move it into it. I mean, like the, the signature can accept it by value or our value reference, whichever is more convenient for you. But write std move of s so that it actually moves away, right? Well, you're just you're just giving you're 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 actually writing down the semantic contract that you're done with the struct now. Um, I, I, uh, be surprised if you actually get the optimization. I, I'm so glad you said that, Dave. Uh, so so uh, Dave was pointing out that you might not get all the optimizations you want if you pass it by an R value reference. I completely agree. Um, I like passing by value. I, I've had colleagues of mine that work on the optimizer that swear up and down their times when you need to pass it by R value reference because by value will have a cost. We can keep debating it, but I didn't want to preclude them being right. <laughs> I tend to agree with you. <laughs> All right, we had, a, we had some other questions over here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make another sweep through. Hartman, you can just cut us off whenever you feel like it. Another five minutes? Sure. Okay. So as a simple as a developer who doesn't know much about the internal compilers and all this kind of stuff, I had never heard about it. What do you think is the best way to move forward with these kinds of suggestions and understanding the So what do I think is the best way? I was, I was skipping the you know, self-compliments there. But what, what do I think is the best way to move forward with these types of suggestions in, in the C++ community? I, I, I genuinely gave this talk mostly for what you described. I wanted people to be aware of how optimizers see their code and to think about that when writing their code, not from the way that we have it historically with C and like thinking about registers and, and you know machines, but thinking about the abstractions they're using Right, whether those are the right abstraction models, whether they're creating, you know, an impedance mismatch that the optimizer is going to struggle with, right? I want it, I, I think that that should be kind of present in the mind of anyone who's writing library code at the least, and potentially C++ code universally, because without that, you will you will doom every piece of code you write to to poor performance, and and also to kind of dispel some of the myths and and, and misconceptions about it. I, I think you know I, I highlighted a couple of specific misconceptions that I, I think are easy to get to fall into, and it's not obvious unless you've thought about the optimizer framework as a framework why that doesn't fit. My real hope is that C++ developers think about optimizer frameworks at least at a high level, so that when the next pattern arises, they actually have the frame, the framework for thinking critically about that pattern, right? Because I presented like a couple of specific patterns that are problematic here, but there's going to be other patterns in the future, right? And so I'm hoping that we can kind of get more people thinking about how optimizers work in the broader community, and then they're going to recognize these problems as they come up, not after the fact. Uh, 
Uh, is there a way to detect these things with profiling? Yes, profiling. It, it will point at your slow paces in your code, but a lot of the things I'm pointing out are things which aren't going to show up as hot spots. They're things that you have to do systematically throughout your code, and they're going to remove this kind of small piece of performance overhead every single place you do it. And so, so in some senses, you can't do it with the profiling tool, and I don't know why you would want to, because it's not about finding the one place where you do this, right? It's about changing your fundamental habits. Trust the compiler. You have no idea how much how smart the compiler is. It's terrifying. <laughs> I, I, I say that like so so I'm a little biased. I wrote the inline cost analysis for LVM, so of course I think it's the right way to inline things. But genuinely speaking, I usually would make p worse decisions than the compiler will because I'm a human. And, and I'm, I'm subject to things like ego and, you know, you know, you know, tunnel vision. And so I think like, yes, my loop is the most important loop in the program. And the compiler says, no, <laughs> we've got like one or two more questions. Ah, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, I'm getting there. So if, we, if you're returning large objects by value, what should you do to prevent breaking RVO? Um, I have many answers for that. Pragmatically, um, either return an, a temporary or return the first variable you declared in your function. Not because that's a good rule, but because every compiler I've known that has working RVO worked under those situations. I think that's a terrible rule. I think you should never think about RVO and the compiler should make it work. And that you should file bugs mercilessly against your compiler implementers until that becomes the case. Um, and I think that move semantics largely helped move us away from having to think about RVO. Because in most cases now, if you don't get RVO, you instead get a move. I would hope. The very back. Thanks. How do you feel about issuing the no six? Open, I mean, opening up the optimizer a bit so that you adamantly can opposed. You can show whether you're losing, you know, whether you have enough information to do some decisions. So, or so, not. so the optimizer absolutely knows when the programmer has made a mistake and they're losing, uh, uh, they're losing performance. What they don't know is when it matters, because the optimizer sees, you know, missed optimizations everywhere, literally everywhere. Okay, I don't know how easily we could divine an, a, 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 some kind of notification system that would only notify the users when it mattered. I think we'd fail. The other problem is that uh, every single optimization has suffers from from action at a distance. Right, it's, it's almost inherent. Right, we're we're doing this call graph walk because we're doing this call graph interprocedural analysis. There's always going to be action at a distance. When there's action at a dis distance, that means that you, an innocent programmer, can suddenly get you know, missed optimization warnings from your compiler through no fault of your own. And that doesn't actually help you because there's nothing you can do to fix it either, right? You didn't change anything, but someone else's code somewhere else that you don't control and you can't modify change in a subtle way that causes your code to stop optimizing. Right? That's telling you that is, is actually going to encourage the wrong behavior as you overcompensate and try to micro optimize your code for this moving target of these other people's stuff. And that's not what we want. Well, isn't it also true that that in order to for the compiler to say you missed an optimization that was valid, you would have to be able to prove that there was no semantic change and therefore could have made the optimization itself? Uh, if you define the diagnostic so narrowly, then yes, it is true. But most of the proposals I've seen that are serious um, are like, you know, if you will give us this semantic leeway, then we can optimize, which you can do. But that's like, the fact that they're not that rigorous is why they happen everywhere, right? Every optimization that doesn't fire would produce one. I don't think it's a tenable thing. Anyways, I really hate to. With that, we have to cut it off. So, thank you.